and the people of God said, Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because this is your doing. To bring us together, to gather us together in your will so that we can study together. And we thank you for all that we have learned in the past and for what you are revealing to your people. Lord, we pray today you reveal your mind once again to us in Jesus' name. And we pray that the study of the word will make us stronger in our Christian lives in Jesus' name. Within us, Lord, we pray you put the courage, the conviction, and the strength spiritually so that we'll be able to stand on our feet and we'll be able to live the life you want us to live in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, for those of us who are here, for our brothers and sisters, in all the locations where we're learning together, we pray, Lord, Lord, this will make every one of us strong. Every one of us vibrant and spiritually and available to serve you in Jesus' name. We pray that you strengthen and build up every family too. Build the church up, Lord. And we pray, Lord, what we reveal today will make us go forward in the way of the Lord and the path of righteousness. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study once again tonight. What a wonderful thing to dedicate and consecrate such a time like this unto the Lord and listen to His Word and have the Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. Take this Scripture of Truth and interpret and apply it to our hearts so that We'll be stronger in the things of the Lord. As you know, we're in Daniel. And we're now in Daniel chapter 4. We've read already, we've studied already Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 through to 27. Now we're coming to verse 28. Would you please open your Bible with me? Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. What does that mean? All this came. You have to know the background. I have to know what has been said already. Before you understand that verse 28, that all that the Lord had revealed, he revealed he to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar did not understand the dream. He had seen this great tree, a flourishing tree, with many branches and leaves. And then this tree was so tall, was so high, it reached very much onto the sky. And then he saw that a watcher, an holy one, an angel of God came and announced in that dream, caught the tree down. All the branches, all the fruits, all the beauty, all the splendor, everything totally destroyed. But leave the stone, leave the stem. And then the dew will come upon that storm, that storm, or that stem, seven times. And then after that, it will grow again. He didn't understand, but even though he didn't understand, it terrified him. It troubled his spirit. He called his magicians and sociers and the Chaldeans as he usually did. And he said, this is the dream I have. Can you make the interpretation for me? And they, they didn't know anything. How could they know? Because it takes a spiritual man to discern, to understand, to interpret what the Almighty God had revealed. At last, he called Daniel and he said, Daniel, I know that the spirit of the Holy God is in thee and that no secret troubles thee tell me the vision of my dream. For I have seen, which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. He had no doubt in his heart. The God of heaven had revealed something in the dream. And he knew the servant of the God of heaven will be able to interpret unto him this dream. And then he told Daniel the dream. If you remember what we studied, what we studied last week, when Daniel had that, it surprised him. He was astonished. He couldn't talk. The interpretation of that dream the meaning of that revelation shocked him because a strange thing was coming upon the Nebuchadnezzar. 
And then he told Nebuchadnezzar, would you look at verse 19? Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished. That means surprised, amazed, astonished for one hour. And his thoughts troubled him. That is, when he thought about the dream, when he thought about the revelation, that troubled him. By the way, you know that Daniel was a person, he wasn't just hearing the word, he wasn't just seeing the vision, he wasn't just interpreting the dream. Anytime he had, he had a revelation, and, he, and then he saw the interpretation that bothered him, especially when the interpretation was going to bring judgment, indignation, and wrath upon the wicked, upon the sinners. Look at Daniel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations, that means my thoughts, much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me. But I catch the matter in my heart. You see, Daniel, he was always meditating upon the word. And when God made that revelation to him, he said, My thoughts, my cogitations troubled me. In fact, the trouble was so much within that it even changed my countenance. The same thing here as Daniel saw what was coming upon King Nebuchadnezzar. It says, My thoughts troubled me. They were looking at, at chapter 4, verse 19 of the king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Eventually now, he gave the interpretation. And as he gave the interpretation, it was very clear, very direct. He told the Padnezer, in verse 20, he said, It is thou, O king. He said, King, this is you. Something is coming. There is a decree. There is a decision coming from heaven. The judgment is going to come upon thee. And then it says, this judgment will continue until you will know that the most high rules in the affairs of men. Before he finished, he gave him a counsel. And he said, this is what you do. We can avert this. We can change this. And this is your kind of king. You can turn everything around. When God brings the message of judgment, when God brings revelation of judgment, you can turn it around by repentance and living in righteousness. Now verse 27, wherefore, O king, let my, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break up thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. It may be a lightning of thy tranquility. So after interpreting the king's dream, Daniel gave him the counsel, directing him to repent and to walk righteously before God. The Cadnesar said nothing to Daniel, neither did he pray unto God. He wasn't angry at Daniel. He knew that Daniel just interpreted the dream. This was revelation from heaven. And Daniel was so faithful and so truthful in telling the king, here is the interpretation. And so he didn't, he didn't get angry, he wasn't truthful, didn't do anything wrong unto Daniel. The only thing is that he did nothing about the revelation. He did nothing about the counsel. He did nothing about averting reversing that judgment of God. And for the next 12 months, God did not bring any judgment in fulfillment of the dream. And what do you think that the Kadesa must have been thinking? That, well, God must have forgotten. Maybe in the spot of the moment, God said, this is what I'm going to do. And since I just overlooked that, out of sight is out of mind. Out of mind is out of thought. Out of thought is out of action. God has forgotten. He's not going to do anything about it. Isn't that the way we think? Isn't that the ideas people have? 
in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, because the sentence, the verdict, because the pronouncement and the announcement of the judgment does not come immediately, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully searching them to do evil. Nebuchadnezzar must have been thinking, God has forgotten. He's not going to do anything about it. And Nebuchadnezzar was thinking, oh, you just overlook everything, just neglect everything, and just push everything aside and go your way. Don't argue. But don't think about it. Don't put your mind to that judgment. How can that be? One month went, and two months passed, and even eleven months passed until the twelfth month. And then eventually the judgment came. Look at verse 12 of that place I'm reading. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days which are bought, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. We shouldn't ever misunderstand or miss it to preach the patience of God, the long suffering of God, the perseverance of God. Because patience was mistaken for divine forgetfulness. That's what Nebuchadnezzar thought. God has forgotten. He's not going to do anything about it. The dream is past. The interpretation is gone, the fulfillment is forgotten, but no, it's coming, the Padnesa. God is not suffering, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The sinner's pride makes him to abuse God's patience, and his regard is not suffering. Did God forget the prophecy of judgment on the Padnesa? No. The seat does the most high still rule in the affairs of men for oh, years. The king continued in his indifference and in his iniquity. The dream had troubled him and the interpretation must have frightened him. But in the passage of time, the mind had regained its false peace. Nothing will happen, he thought. But then as we look at it today, and as we look at what really happened today, then you understand what actually took place. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 29. At the end of 12 months, you see that? At the end of 12 months, why was God waiting? After the interpretation had been given, because the Lord wanted to give him chance to repent, chance to return from his evil way, so that he will turn towards the Lord, and that repentance and turning, that change of mind, that change of heart, will bring the change in the judgment that should have come. But then at the end of 12 months, he watched in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Those who have looked at history, they have told us about the beauty and the splendor of Babylon at that time. Everything in Babylon appeared great. It was one of the most magnificent and luxurious cities in the ancient world. So publicly constructed, it spread over an area of 15 square miles, the river Euphrates flowing diagonally across the city. In fact, we are told that the city was surrounded by a wall 350 feet high. Think about that. 350 feet high, that was a wall, and 87 feet thick. Exceeding, extending 35 feet below the ground to prevent tunneling. That is, uh, enemies coming from outside wanting to come and wage war against Babylon. The wall was so thick that the people will not be able to tunnel through, and that's why they did that. Not only that, around the, around the walls, you have, uh, you have the, a, a ditch. 
And that bridge was made to serve as an additional protection against attacking enemies. That means then if the people were going to attack Babylon, you have to cross that river all around the walls. And you have to dig again, you have to dig the wall to be able to enter. Not only that, they had 250 watchtowers placed strategically around all around the walls of the city. And then not only that, we're told that it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And this day, after 12 months, that uh, Daniel had interpreted the dream, the Kanisa got up. And then he looked around, he, he, he got his strategic place very high, and he looked all around Babylon and said, This is great Babylon that I have built with no help of anybody. Did you even think of the help of the architects and the builders and all, all that? I have built. Did you think of God that gave him the skill, the wisdom, the finance, the resources? I have built. And who did I build it, build it for? For the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. You can see the pride. He was proud, number one, of his wisdom. Is built such a great, magnificent thing. And number two, for his skill. Number three, for his learning. Number four, for his power. Number five, for his position. Number six, for his achievement. In arrogant boast, he said, It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Those words drew. The inevitable judgment of God upon his head, judgment came as it was predicted. I want you to look at verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. The watcher from heaven, the holy one from heaven, an angel from heaven reminded him, Nebuchadnezzar, do you remember the dream? Yes, he did. Do you remember the interpretation? Yes, he must. To you it is spoken. The kingdom now is departed from you, and it shall drive thee but such it you from men, and thy dwelling shall be for the beasts of the field. They shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. The same hour was he fulfilled upon the Padnesar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his ears were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the days, I, Daniel, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his son. Or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and my glory, the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor idols. Who did he honor now? The King of heaven. All whose words are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, tell me the rest. He is able to obey it. That's what he learned. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at the judgment. And we're looking at the results of that wrath judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar. We're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, 
the expression of pride condemned by God. The expression of pride condemned by God. Number two, extraordinary punishment confirmed by God. I have been told before that that judgment was coming. And now that extraordinary strange judgment was confirmed by God. Number three, excellent praise and commendation of God. At last he woke up, at last he realized that the Creator is greater than the creature. At last he realized that the God of heaven, the King of heaven, is greater than any king on earth. At last he realized that he is the most high and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing in the sight of the Almighty God. Point number one now, the expression of pride condemned by God. But looking at Daniel chapter 4, reading from verse 28. Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon? that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and by, for the honor of my majesty? Is that humility or pride? I said, is that humility or pride? Pride. When you talk like that, when anyone talks